Okay, so we want to start looking at this review for your probability and statistics unit test. And we're going to start by looking at combinations and permutations. So remember, combinations and permutations are just how many possible outcomes scenarios could have. And the main difference is that for combinations, the order does not matter. For permutations, the order does matter. So for here, for this number one, we have that seven people are swimming for gold, silver, and bronze. Now, depending on the order, uh, it does matter. You know, if you finish first, you're going to be a lot happier than if you finish third. So given that this order matters, it's a permutation, and there are seven people, and we're choosing three positions. So if I go over to my calculator, uh, I'm going to put down the n value, so n is 7, and I go back over to my probability menu, and I actually have this NPR button. So I choose 2. And that looks just like mine, except I actually plugged in for N and R in this over here. So that gives me an answer of 210 possibilities. For the next one, I have a committee of three from nine total people. So that means that there are nine people, and I'm choosing three of them. Now here, I'm just making a committee. I'm not naming the first person I picked committee chair or anything. So the order does not matter, so it's a combination problem. So now again, I put that nine, I go back to my probability menu, so I go math to PRB, and here I wanna choose combination, so I choose that combination. Oops, I actually did not choose my nine, apparently. And I choose three, and that leaves me with 84. For number three, uh, John here is making fruits from five, or making juice from five different fruits, and only uses two. So order does not matter here, so it's a combination problem. And it's gonna be five choose three. So that's five, with a combination three, so that's gonna be 10. Looking down here at number four, we have 10 different people who are being chosen for a chairman and a co-chairman. Uh, assuming that the chairman gets more votes, um, this is gonna be a permutation problem. The order does matter. Whoever is chosen first is the chairman. And we're choosing that from 10 for two positions. So that's gonna be 10 with a permutation two to give us 90. 90 possible outcomes there. All right, so using your calculator is really nice and the best way to do these calculations of combinations and permutations. Now moving on to probability, we don't need our calculator here, but what we do need to look at is a probability tree. So I'm actually gonna make that right in the center here. And the probability tree uh, is going to show all the possible outcomes. So I can make a you know, a, a tree diagram that shows red, red, green, 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 yellow, 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 all the different combinations. But to save space, I can say, all right, well, I could either get red, green, or yellow, and put the probability of each one. So probability to get red the first time is two out of 10. Probability to get green the second time is five out of 10. Probability to get yellow the first time is three out of 10. Now from there, Again, I could choose for my second draw, red, green, or yellow for all of these original first draws. Now if I choose red the first time and I choose red the second time, well, the first time there are 10. So when I go to pick again, now there are only nine marbles. So for all of these marbles in my second round pick, if you will, the sample space is only nine because now there are only nine marbles in the bag. And this is key because it says without replacement, which, mean I, which means I do not put that original marble back in. All right, so if I pick red the first time, there are originally two. I pick one out and now there's one red. So the probability I pick out that red is one out of nine. Now there's still five green and there's still three yellow. So their probabilities 
At least the numerators remain the same, but again the sample space has changed, so the denominator is now 9. Um, and that's the way it goes for the rest of these. So if I pick green the first time, that's a probability of 5 out of 10. Second time is 4 out of 9, but red remains unchanged at 2, and yellow remains unchanged at 3. If I pick yellow the first time, probability of 3 out of 10. Second time, it's probability of 2 out of 9. For green, the probability, whoops, there are still 5 marbles left in, so probability now is 5 out of 9, and there's still 2 red marbles, so prob probability there is 2 out of 9. So this is the key for all these problems. And so when I look at number, or letter A here, and it says probability of green and red, that's a probability I could have green and then red, plus the probability I have red and then green. It does not specify the order as it does in letter C here. So the probability I have green and red, well, I multiply those probabilities. So that's 5 out of 10 times 2 out of 9. And I add that to the probability I have red, which is 2 over 10, times green, which is 5 over 9. So I get 10 over 90 plus 10 over 90, which is 20 over 90, or a probability of 2 over 9. I'm going to skip uh, B for right now because if you look at C, it's similar to A, except it specifies the order. So this is not saying probability of green and yellow. It's saying the probability I get green first and yellow second. So the probability I get green first is 5 out of 10. And I multiply that the probability I get yellow second, which is 3 over 9. I multiply these together to get 15 over 90, which is the same as 1 over 6. So here, I don't calculate the probability of yellow and then green, because that disobeys the order that was given here. For B, this is conditional probability. So what's the probability I get red second given I get yellow first. Well, if I look at yellow first, that's just 3 over 10. Actually, I can probably try and copy this whole thing. No, maybe not. Um, but if I look here, I can see probability I get yellow is 3 out of 10. Well, it's given that yellow has already happened. So it's 10 out of 10. It's 100% this has happened. So given that this has happened, none of these other possibilities can occur. So what's the probability I get red? Simply 2 out of 9. So the probability there is 2 out of 9. Now given this formula, probability of red second given yellow first, we would have to calculate the probability of red second and yellow first and divide that by the probability of yellow first, which makes sense because that would leave us with the probability of red second, which again is 2 ninths. So you can use this formula and work out the mathematical uh, calculations, but if you just kind of look at this probability tree, hopefully it's, it's really simple and straightforward to get to ninths. All right, and the probability of two of the same, well, we have to look for all the combinations. So that's probability of red and red, plus probability of green and green, plus the probability of yellow and yellow. So probability of red and red, that's 2 tenths times 1 ninth, plus 5 tenths times 4 ninths, plus 3 tenths times 2 ninths. So this gives me 2 over 90 plus 20 over 90 plus 6 over 90, which is 28 over 90, or 14 over 45. Notice, um, it's not just any old two of the same, it's just two of the same. So you have, to you have to count all the combinations of two of the same, which is red and red, green and green, yellow and yellow. Add them up, and that's a probability you get two of the same. <clears throat> okay, moving on now to uh, diagrams. We First, start with histograms. Now here, these intervals are already laid out for us, which is great. They're evenly spaced, which is fantastic. 
Um, so it's going to be easier for me to graph. I don't have to calculate bin size and width. Cumulative frequency, that's just all the frequencies add together. Now if I add these, I get 6, 11, 20, and 30, which it does say there are 30 people. So the total here is 30. So by the time I get to cumulative frequency, these should all add up to 30. Well, not add up to 30, but the last value here should be 30 because what I'm doing is I'm adding up all the frequencies up to that point. So here the frequency is 2. The only thing to add is itself, so it's just 2. 2 plus 0 is still 2. But for the next interval, 2 plus 0 plus 4 is 6. 2 plus 0 plus 4 plus 5 that's 11. 2 plus 0 plus 4 plus 5 plus 9 is 20. 2 plus 0 plus 4 plus 5 plus 9 plus 7 is 27. If I add the 2, I get 29. And then all these plus 1 is 30. So that's cumulative frequency. Now relative frequency, you divide. So what we can do is we can go back to your calculator and you can divide these values. So for the relative frequency for the first one, that's going to be 2 divided by 30, which is 0 0.067. I have to do a little bit of rounding here, but that's OK. The next one is 0 over 30, which is just 0. And then we have 4 over 30. So 4 divided by 30 is 0 0.13. Then we have 5 over 30, which is 0 0.167. Then we have 9 divided by 30, ooh, which is a nice 0 0.3. Then we have 7 divided by 30 which is 0 0.23. And we have 2 divided by 30, which again is 0 0.067. Because I already calculated that, so of course, why would it change? And then we have 1 divided by 30, which is 0 0.03, and that goes on three repeating. So here I'm rounding these off, and that's fine. Now, when I round these, there's going to be some calculation error, some leeway. But if I add these all up, it should be equal to 1. I'm not going to add that now because actually it's probably going to be off by a little bit. But that's fine because I rounded. And so now I want to make a histogram of this. So um, using these values, I want to make a nice histogram. So um, on my x-axis is going to be all these intervals and the starting points there. So uh, I want to make a nice straight line there. It's my x-axis, and then I have my y-axis. On the x-axis, I'm going to have the starting point for all of those intervals. So first off is 0. Then next up, it's 14. And then 28. And then 42, and then 56. Probably could have spread these out a little bit more, but that's okay. 70, 84, and 98, and then 112. So notice that these are where all my intervals start because these are integer values. So for 0 to 13, I'm going to go all the way up to 14 because 13, there is no 13.5, there is no 13.8 in this data set. So that means that if I go to 13, the exact next value is 14. So they're right next to each other. So the histogram bars will be right next to each other. Going on the y-axis, my highest frequency is 9. So I could actually do a scale of 1, that'd be fine. So I can do 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. Why not? 
And uh, on the y-axis, this is going to be the frequency. And on the x-axis, I think this is, yep, time in minutes. So it's important to label our axes. And then I make little bars. So for the first set, first interval, the frequency is 2. So I go up to 2 and make this nice little bar. For the second group, I have a frequency of zero, so I can actually just leave this blank. Some people like to draw a little line there. Uh, it's not necessary. 28 through 41 is going to be a frequency of four. So going up to four. Just like that. 42, the next interval is going to be a frequency of five. So I'm actually just going to build right off of that, go over. And because I'm drawing this by hand, obviously this is not going to look pretty, but um, it's, it's effective. Uh, next interval starts at 56, and it has a frequency of 9. So going all the way up to 9, eyeballing it a little bit. Going all the way up from 70. Wow, that's, that's bad. I'm actually going to cheat right there because that's pretty atrocious, uh, give myself a nice straight line. Uh, it helps if I actually stop it there, so close enough. <laughs> and next up is the next interval, which has a frequency of 7, so measuring over from 7, going up. And then we have the next interval with a frequency of 2 again. And then the final frequency has a frequency of 1. And there's my nice little histogram. So it doesn't matter really what you have the scale as on this x-axis, but um, it should be uniform, and it's going to be really nice if you can put the starting points of the intervals there. All right, then we have these values, and we want to find some statistical uh, vocabulary words. So the mean. The mean, remember, is the average. So that's the total of them divided by how many there are. So again, I can use a calculator for that. If I look, I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 values. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add them up. So 22 plus 23 plus 27 plus 30. Now, in your calculator, there are table features to add these up, um, which is great. Um, but if I'm just adding these up, it's probably just going to be easier for me just to type these in. So that's my sum. And then if I divide that by how many there are, 11, that's going to give me this. So I can say 33.91 is going to be my mean, which again is the same as average. So that's at 33.91. The median, that's the middle number. So if I look here, there are 11. So if I count in 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, this 55, or sorry, this 35 has five numbers to the left and five numbers to the right. That is the exact middle. So that is the median. The mode is the most frequently occurring number, and here, a bunch of ones, and then you can see there are two values of 35, so 35 is also the mode. Now the first quartile is going to be the median of this lower half. So given that there are five numbers down here, the median is right there, and that's Q1, so that's 27. And the third quartile, the upper quartile, is the upper half, the median of the upper half, I should say. And that's 38. Find the interquartile range. That's just going to be Q3 minus Q1. So that is equal to 38 minus 27, which is 11. And then for the stem and leaf plot, I want to draw my nice you know, branch there. And uh, I'm going to have these values, so I'm going to have 2, 3, and 4. Nice, simple stem and leaf plot. 2 represents the 20, so I have 22, 23, and 27. For the 30s, I have 30, 
34, 35, 35, 37, and 38. And for the 40s, I have 43 and 49. What I definitely need, though, is I need a key. And that's just going to show me that 2 line 2 is equal to 22. And 4 line 9 is equal to 49. Now to actually draw the box and whisker plot, I'm actually going to take these values and I'm going to put them on. Now I'm going from 20 to 40 here, um, about, or sorry, 20 to 50, about. So, um, you know, I can choose, oh, I don't want to do blue. Um, it's a range of 25, so yeah, I could do values of two. It'll probably work best. So I'm going to start with 20. I'm going to count by two. So that's 22, that's 24, that's 26, that's 28, that's 30, that's 32, that's 34, that's 36, 38, 40, 42, 44, 46, 48, and 50. And I think my largest value is 49, so I'm good. So what I want to do is I want to plot these values here. So the extremes are going to get dots. So this lower extreme is 22 and this upper extreme is 49. So at 22, um, which is right there, I'm going to put a dot. At 49, which is going to be halfway between 48 and 50, I put another dot. And then I have vertical lines for my quartiles, which are Q1 and Q3. So that's 27 and 38, so at 27, and again at 38, and then for my median, which is 35. Now all I have to do is connect these as best I can, and draw my little whiskers for my box, and that's my box and whisker plot. So notice it's elevated above the x-axis, it's not touching it, and I have this even scale. So from this, I can read what the values are from this value, or from this data set. Um, it's not necessary to actually put what they specifically are. And again, the key is the uniform scale. So that's a test, so that's a review packet. Hopefully um, you do all right with this. Uh, make sure you go over these questions, and let me know if you have any questions.